digital capture recording. Hi, it's Dr. Bush and Dr. Snodgrass with Park Urology, and we have a patient here with a penoscrotal meatus, what looks like some ventral curvature. I'll try to show you from the side view here. And we're going to take you through our stepwise algorithm of repairing proximal hypospadias, how we make a decision for a one-stage tip repair versus a two-stage stag repair, and go from there. So we always start off the case measuring the glands. In this case, it measures 13 millimeters. That's right about average for a patient with proximal hypospadias. Our average was 12.8 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And we use the calipers at the beginning of the case to document that because it changes our glands dissection later in the case, depending on what that measurement is. Now we're placing a 5-0 proline through the glands for our retraction suture. And we start these proximal cases by placing just a, an 8 French straight sound through the urethra so that we can see what the overlying coverage is and so we can see that from here to here it's so thin that there's no way we could separate the skin right here from the underlying tissues of the urethral plate and urethra so we're going to make our initial incision right down here where the thin where the skin gets a bit thicker and we'll go ahead and extend that all the way down the midline into the scrotum because we're going to want to dissect all of the urethral tissues into a, an anatomically normal location. Many boys with proximal hypospadias will have um, a, uh, a urethra that's essentially going in the wrong location in the scrotum, too anteriorly located. And so we want to normalize all of that. Now, right here, we're going on either side of the urethral plate and we're making sure to leave enough mucosal collar right here underneath the gland swings. Because it looks really odd if, you don't, uh, if you're going to circumcise a patient if you don't have a, a mucosal collar. Now for patients with proximal hypospadias, of course, you don't have to perform a, a circumcision if the family uh, prefers foreskin reconstruction but then you need to have a discussion about what to use for graft material for your stag repair in the event that these patients have significant curvature, which they often will. And so if they prefer to have foreskin reconstruction, then we would be using oral graft. In this case, the family had desired a circumcision before the baby was born and diagnosed with hypospadias, and so we will follow those wishes. Now right here, you can see that this is a more attached to the glands, and so we're going to bring this out just a little bit so that we can keep a symmetric distance from the uh, glands penis there all the way around. Now, in this case, as a proximal hypospadias, at the beginning, we want to go ahead and inject some dilute epinephrine. This is 1 to 100,000 dilution of uh, epinephrine. And we do that because oftentimes there's no spongiosal tissue in these patients. And so the, I'm sorry, no dartos tissue. And so oftentimes the skin will be attached directly to the spongiosum. And it's very easy to get into the spongiosum with your initial skin incision or your initial dissection. And of course that um, can bleed. And so we want to try to separate the skin from the sp underlying spongiosum here. And, and using this, um, as a hydro dissection will help with that. Also, say while that's working, she mentioned foreskin reconstruction and oral grass. And the, the important point we wish to make is that it is never our preference to use an oral grass. It's only in the circumstance of a family that, for example, comes from Europe where the boy would be quite different from classmates if he's circumcised. But otherwise, we never. That's for several reasons. Um, we prefer it because it's much thinner than oral graft, 
And that's very important in these boys with tiny glands. Um, we, you know, we want to get the glands approximated um, in the same way the boys without hypospadias have with normal measurements. And that's much more difficult to do over a thick graft. And even though lower lip is certainly thinner than cheek, it's still not nearly as thin as propitial skin. So that's the, the main reason that we prefer propitial skin. But also there's no do donor site morbidity. And that's a, an important issue because although it's a very low rate, it can affect the smile in some of these patients. fold here. We're going to try to unfurl that. is often one of the trickier parts of the surgery is to get this plane started correctly. is the same plane we dissect in for our distal repairs as well, but for a, dis a different reason. We dissect in this plane on our distals um, because we want to preserve that ventral dartos for a coverage layer over our neourethra. In a patient with proximal hypospadias, we would never choose dartos tissue as our coverage layer because we've 
published that that's associated with a higher risk of fistulas, we're going to use tunica vaginalis in those circumstances. So we're, we're not trying to preserve dartos tissues here for coverage layer. We're simply trying to stay out of the spongiosum, but it's nice. Right that's right, it's right here. But it's nice that we practice this dissection in the distal repairs because it's, it's much stickier and, and much more difficult to hold these without ripping skin to dissect in the correct plane in a proximal case. And so it's a plane that you want to be very familiar with from your distal repairs. Which are, of course, 10 times more common than a proximal. So now we'll shift planes. We were directly under the skin on the ventral surface, but here on the dorsal surface, the dartos tissues will be um, going with the skin, will be on top of Buck's fascia here and our dorsal plane. Most likely, in this patient. Is the fact that there's very little ventral dartos in boys with proximal hypospadias, as we've been saying. And because we do graft repairs, we're going to take the dartos off of the dorsal skin. And, and essentially, there's just not much dartos even available, and certainly won't be available to us at the second stage. It's all the way down here, but it looks like this is wanting to come, and we can just go ahead and come across that. Go back over here real quick. So this uh, patient is six months old. For proximal hypospadias, we prefer to wait until they're six months old to do the surgery. For distals, we can start at three months because most patients with distal hypospadias um, are born at full term. And here in the United States, um, from an anesthesia perspective, that's the age that we can start to do outpatient surgery is at three months and full term patients. In boys born with proximal hypospadias, they're much more likely to be born prematurely. And we want to give them the full time for their postnatal testosterone surge because of the statistically significantly smaller width of glands. Now, of course, that glands width is almost always within normal limits, meaning that it's on a bell-shaped curve. But statistically, it's smaller than boys with distal hypospadias and smaller than newborns 
without hypospadias at all, just undergoing newborn circumcision. So that's another important point to make. Very few boys with hypospadias have a true micropenis. In fact, that's quite uncommon. But on the spectrum of normal, many boys with proximal hypospadias are are not working very well. invariably a few little perforating blood vessels and so we'll stop to get some hemostasis here in a second but it's really important to get the best exposure that you can while hiding your incision lines in natural lines and and as you see there's a natural line that's here and and so when you sew it back up you don't see any visible scars except in a, in a plane that you would normally, in a location that you normally see it. And that's very important to try to hide your incisions in places where it's not visible once things have healed up. So all of this surgery can be done through a circumferential uh, circumcision and down the median refe and into the midline of the scrotum. Thank you. 
in terms of skin closure, we want to give the appearance of the longest possible penis here. So that's another reason to really drop this scrotum down. All of these little nuanced things make a big difference into the post-operative appearance. Oh, one more. That's right. I have seen other surgeons do a hypospatial repair in which they made a urethra, and then when they were done, they didn't really realign the skin, but left relative deficient skin ventrally and dorsally, so the, the penis still looked at normal. It just had a, a, a meatus that was further distal. And we, we don't consider that a successful outcome from surgery. The penis should look normal. Mm -hmm. That's another thing to state on the outset. Even in the most severe hypospadias, perineal with marked bending, which we have measured it up to 120 degrees, even in that case. That's after degloving. After degloving. With a small gland. Most likely, we still don't know for sure the extent of curvature. And if this patient had a straight penis or less than 30 degrees of curvature, then we can do a tip repair. This, the statistics tell us that most likely this patient will not. But that's why we make our initial incisions the way that we do, because we don't know for sure, and we don't have to know at the onset of the case, if you cut across the urethral plate, then you are destining this boy to a two-stage repair who might not have needed it. Yeah, I just happened to have examined him yesterday and seen him with an erection, and, and uh, he had over 75 degrees of curvature. And so while that could improve sufficiently with the blood In addition to gaining length on his native urethra by doing this dissection, we're also going to make it much easier to catheterize this 
you know, child as a child or if he ever needs a catheter as an adult for any reason because the urethra will be running, you know, in a normal location downward as opposed to out superficially along the scrotum and then down at a right angle. So a good trick here is to go from known to unknown. So starting up near your level of your corpora at your penoscrotal junction and then tracing that down as the corpora split is a helpful maneuver uh, when you're just beginning this dissection. sure that we can see. So now our scrub is holding the retractors here so that we have all hands available for this dissection and great visualization of which direction the urethra is heading because it's impossible to know in many of these boys, is it heading down in a more orthotopic location or is it still traveling more interiorly than it should be. In this boy, it looks like it's actually turned the corner and, and traveling now in a more normal location. Right. We've seen boys, and you never know uh, which one in proximal cases, but we've seen boys in which the urethra went almost to the anus before it turned, and um, we had to dissect way down in the perineum to get to the end of it and release it For a second, and get a bigger one. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop that. Okay, can't see. Need me to move a little bit. Got it. Okay. There's still a little one right here. Let's go ahead and get that while we've got the Gerald's. Okay. Okay, oh. let's reset here for a minute. I'm mm. going to a little, give us a little time. I think I may benefit from opening this just a bit more. And you could see with this dissection how much more further I could uh, secure the penis up to that drape. So we've really made great progress in terms of length that we've gained. So you see we're basically splitting the scrotum in half. Knowing that there's no aesthetic downside to doing that and the benefit is that we really can have great exposure towards this deep portion of the native urethra and this is it looks scary to folks who haven't, you know, been down here and or seen this dissection in proximal hypospadias, but it's one that we do in every single patient 
for all the reasons that we've outlined to you. perineal body down there. And I just want to make sure I'm not in the urethra or sponge around the urethra. There we go. So we want to get against the, there we go. Perfect. We want to get against the wall of the urethral bulb here and dissect right against that. That's a safe plane. That's where I am. See it just moving up. Perfect. So that's what we want to do because, again, that's going to give us some, another centimeter or so of length, which can be very important to have enough skin later. Pumper. Others have talked about this dissection. you to here mm, somewhere over there maybe right there there we go We essentially want to take any tissues off that might be contributing to curvature. And so now's a really good opportunity to talk about the reasons for curvature. Number one, you hear us speaking about penile curvature and not core D because there is no such tissue called core D tissue. And, and we find that it's very confusing to refer to curvature as core D because it, that implies that there's some sort of core D that you can resect and the penis will be straight. And that simply isn't the case. So when it comes to ventral curvature, there's three reasons that the penis can be curved. Number one are tethering skin and dartos tissues. So that's what we're in the process of dissecting now. We've removed any tethering skin tissues, we're removing any tethering uh, penile or scrotal dartos tissues, and after we do that, then we'll check the artificial erection. So for patients with distal hypospadias, any apparent ventral curvature almost always is due to, oh, we still got one more little guy, I don't um, to tethering skin and dartos tissues, and that's not the case at all for patients with proximal hypospadias. In patients with proximal hypospadias, the curvature is 
far more likely to be due to a short urethra and urethral plate. So that will be the next step of what we're going to evaluate. Or short corporal bodies where the, the tunic albuginea on the ventral surface of the, the penis is shorter than on the dorsal surface. And so we have to evaluate in patients with proximal hypospadias these reasons for curvature in a stepwise fashion. So now we've removed all of the tethering, scrotal, and penile dartos tissues. And so we're going to check an artificial erection. Now the first time we check the erection, we're not going to put a tourniquet on because in patients with proximal hypospadias, sometimes the crux of the curvature can be right here at the penoscrotal junction, and you will miss the curvature if you have a tourniquet on right here. We've seen patients with problems related to that. In this patient, the curvature almost certainly is going to be out here, but it's just our protocol that the first time around we can simply use our fingers with com com manual compression, goniometer, Yep, so once we've verified that the curvature is not down low, then we'll put a tourniquet on. And we always get questions about a tourniquet. We always use a tourniquet every hypospadias patient that we encounter. And we have among the best published outcomes in the world. So it's not an issue to use a tourniquet on a patient. What is an issue is to not see and to not be in the correct plane. So we feel that visualization is, is the most important factor. Now this is a, a goniometer and it is an orthopedic joint measuring device that does an excellent job at measuring the degree of curvature. So for this patient, we're measuring along the corpora and along the glands and we see that his degree of curvature, here's 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. So he's about 53 degrees curved. That's too much for a plication to work. Statistically speaking, if you try to correct 50 plus degrees of curvature with the plication suture, they're going to be back with problems. Recurrent fistula without the crux of the curvature and entire dehiscence of what you've sewn for their neourethra. So, now that we've ruled out all the dartos tissues as the cause for our curvature, the next step is to rule out our urethra and our urethral plate as the cause for our curvature. So we're going to dissect under the spongiosum and mobilize this urethra with our plans to transect the urethra in just a moment here. So there's a nice bloodless plane, of course, between the spongiosum of the urethral plate and urethra and the corpora. We're going to dissect right underneath there. We're just going to continue this dissection for a moment. And then we um, will put it on pause for just a second because there's a surgeon that needs some uh, assistance in the other room. And so this will be a good time to pause and we'll be right back with you. Digital capture resumed. Sides of the urethra down to the penis scrotal junction before we start. 
can see as we're doing this, it, it, it looks like we're gaining little bits of length as we cut this too. But as she said, it's the exception that when we cut the urethral plate, the penis is straight or nearly straight. The vast majority of American boys with bending over 30 degrees have what John Beckett called corporal disproportion, meaning that the ventral surface of the corporate just forms shorter than the dorsal surface. And, and we completely agree with that observation. It's just that John then thought the way to deal with that was with dorsal plication. And, and that has not held up with the test of time. And so we do ventral lengthening instead. So see, we have it free. Now we're just going to cut right here at the corona. And that's all free. And you see how that dropped Look at that. the course. So that at least happen. part of his bending was due to a foreshortened urethra and urethral plate. But you're going to see how we cannot assume that that was all of the bending and, that, and we're going to have to come back and repeat an artificial erection once we finish this dissection of the urethra and, and native urethral plate. And so just like we did anteriorly to remove it from the skin, we're going to do a, a similar dissection here, removing the native urethra and urethral plate from the underlying corpora, again, to gain length on our urethra to minimize the amount of graft that we have. And because we know that in 70% of our patients, we're going to end up doing a ventral lengthening procedure. It's nice to have sufficient length on this, this urethral plate and native urethra in order to actually try to cover some of your corporotomies. So we're going to finish this dissection here in a second, but for right now, we're going to leave this uh, tourniquet on so that we can check and see whether or not we need to do something from a ventral lengthening perspective. Now in Asian boys, what um, we've learned is that most of the time, the etiology of their curvature is due to a foreshortened urethra, and Asian boys will typically be straight after transection of the urethral plate. That's different than European and African boys where there's still curvature. Now, one thing we try to do is just place a little mark. We don't know if that's where the curvature is going to be, but it's a visual indicator for our eyes to see if that's where the curvature is, and it's much easier to do that before he's leaking the saline from our injection. So it looks like we're pretty close in terms of the max curvature with that mark, but he is still significantly bent. So even though we've transected the urethral plate, we can measure his degree of curvature that I'll try to show you over there, which still measures just over 50 degrees. So if you made a technical error and did not repeat an artificial erection after making the surface of the ventral corpora glistening, then you've missed a patient's 50 degrees of curvature and whatever your neourethra you create is very likely not to function in that scenario. And even if the neourethra functions and doesn't get a complete wound dehiscence or recurrent fistulas, this boy is going to have a difficult time with sexual functioning after puberty because 50 degrees of curvature is significant enough that it impairs, uh, dis it, that it makes uh, intercourse difficult for the patient and causes discomfort for the partner. So we're continuing our dissection of the urethra and the uh, attached urethral plate. Approximately, obviously now we are lifting up the formed urethra off of the corpora. And again, this is one of those steps that just has to be done to have a successful stag repair in most patients because 
ago. So that gained a significant length. So rec recall, when we first transected, I couldn't lift the urethra beyond here. Now we can lift it almost back up. Now that still is not what we're going to do for our repair because remember we have to address our, our corporal disproportion and lengthen our sh for shortened ventral surface on the penis. And so this is not going to reach back up once we do that. But it's certainly higher than it was. There's more mobility. We've got at least a centimeter more flexibility on this native urethra to stretch and cover one or two, or if we get lucky, even all three of our corporotomies that we'll be making in just a second. But we wanted to go ahead and do this dissection first, and it's important to do these steps in the correct order, because once we've made those corporotomies, then your assistant loses a hand because they're holding pressure over the corporotomy sites instead of being able to help with this dissection. And so we stop this dissection where the corpora are diverging. But once you start um, doing this dissection, you will see and feel how much length you're gaining by transecting these tethering tissues down here. And that feels like we're in really good shape. The urethra is about to turn through the external sphincter right here. So that's where we have dissected to, is right there. So now we will have some and we'll just squirt it down in this area where we've been operating. And we'll just let that sit while we put our tourniquet back on and go back out and work on the penile shaft where the curvature is. So she put a mark exactly in the right place of the most bent region. And so we're going to plan on making three corporotomy incisions. We don't do a single corporotomy with corporal grafting because our urethroplasty will rely upon a urethrograft and we don't put a urethrograft on top of a corporal graft. So we will rely on to refer to these as, as fairy cuts because the surgical hypospadias team of Horton and Devine originally referred to these as fairy cuts, but we, we've stopped doing that because it, it does seem to be a little misleading. I think people got the impression that fairy cuts were just sort of shallowly through the tunic albuginea, and as you can see, there's nothing shallow about these incisions. They are they go all the way through the tunic albuginea down to the level of the corpora. And so we've just simply gone to referring to these as, as ventral corporotomies. We do three 
because we want some redundancy to the systems. Getting the penis straight is such a critical part, what, what we would consider probably the most important part of proximal hypospadias repair, that you, you want to have redundant systems in place. So you can see that we've stretched from, from 10 millimeters before up to 19 millimeters with a gain of nine millimeters, almost a centimeter in length. And, and while to an adult sized penis, a centimeter may not seem like that big of a deal. And these penises that are three centimeters to go from three to four centimeters is a very big deal in terms of how much length you've gained. Now, once you've done these um, corporotomies, you can actually repeat an artificial erection. You just have to switch from a 23 gauge needle up to a 21 gauge needle. And those show that we may need to go through just a little bit more laterally. He still had just a tiny bit of bend um, of the distal most portion. But mostly straight, and it may just be this Dartos tissues here, but right here is just a little bit more. And, and generally speaking, that increase is about a centimeter. So that gives you kind of a couple of different ballpark figures of when to stop your corporotomies when you've reached that kind of centimeter mark. Now, again, with this idea of redundancy for the most important steps, backup, backup systems. systems, that sounds good. We're going to go ahead and put a single dorsal plication, not as a major straightening maneuver, but, but mainly to splint open these corporotomies while things are healing. So we use a 5-0 proline. We're going to bury the knot. And this will be our only plication suture. Finger happening. And that's out of hundreds. And that's well over a hundred patients. More than two hundred between reduce and primary. And if we had up all the patients we've done it on, not just primaries, it would be close to probably around two hundred or even more. And so we can say with assurance that three corporotomy straightens the penis. Now you notice that we covered this plication suture. We just used a little 7 ovicrol to reapproximate bucks there on the dorsal surface of the penis because we've noted that the skin can stick to the um, um, plication suture back there to that proline and it gives it a really unnatural look to the dorsal surface of the penis. So again, all these little tiny points to try to um, you know, make the penis look as normal as possible and function as normally as possible. And it's not normal for the penile skin to be stuck to the dorsal surface of the penis. So now when we do our gland swings, we've just made a midline incision. We did that superficially with our 69 blade knife. And we're going to carefully dissect the 
wings of the glands off of the underlying corpora. And it's really important here to make sure that you dissect these wings open widely because a, a major technical problem is if you don't put enough gland, uh, graft within the glands itself. And so these glands wings have to be opened widely in order to ensure that there's a sufficient amount of graft in the glands. Yeah, otherwise, the caliber of the distal urethra at the second stage will not be sufficiently wide. So this has to open out like a, like book. a book. Flat like the middle of a book open. And you see this is not, I mean, this is a plane all of us are familiar with. It's just the extent of the dissection. Sometimes we see boys where it's do right stay. here. be sure there's no twisting on your urethra. We're going to remove just a little bit of this muscle from the side to again gain the maximum amount of stretch as we can on our urethra. Okay. We want to be sure that we're not twisting our urethra. So we're going to look at our native mucosa that was up here. That's the best way to orient yourself towards making sure that you're not putting any twist on it. And about every centimeter or so, we're going to place an interrupted 6O PDS to secure the native urethra and the urethral plate back to the corpora with some gentle stretch, but not much. You don't want to put so much stretch on this urethra that the urethra can recurve the penis. Oh, 
to here, we're not going to take it to this top one. This is a little bit too small of an area to place a graft. So we're going to take it right here to give ourselves enough length on the graft. So we'll cover two of our three corporotomies. And that's helpful because if you're going to have graft contracture of a propitial graft, it doesn't happen very often. But when it happens, it's over the sites of the corporotomies. In our hands, that happens about 7% of the time between primaries and redos. So it's not a common thing, but it's very devastating to the family when it happens and you have to regraft or patch the graft. And how many you cover, of course, depend on where your you know, native meatus was, where the bending is, et cetera. The more distal bending, is, it's often hard to cover all three of the corporotomies and leave a sufficient amount of space for the graft, as we mentioned. Mm. But if he'd had a lower bending, we easily could have covered all three of these corporotomies. And that's where it's nice to have an Asian penis where you didn't have to do the corporotomies at all, but that is not our <laughs> Latin lot in life. And another nice aspect of having done our dissection the way we did, where we removed the spongiosum and the urethral plate on block, is that we can use some of the spongy tissues to cover the lateral extent of these corporotomies as well. Now, we know that when we have graft contracture, go down that road. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. Was too many seconds ago. Let's see, what were we talking about? Hmm. I've forgotten. And that was my thought, now that we speak about it. What we were saying is that when 
the grafts contract and for shorten lengthwise, you end up with a penis that is rebent in between stages. And we know that these corporal incisions heal nicely from those few patients where we have graft contracture because essentially you remove the diseased and contracted part of the graft and what you see underneath that when you repeat an artificial erection is that number one, the penis is now straight. Number two, the corporotomy sites have essentially healed over very, yeah, I mean, sometimes you can see the tiniest little divot, but other times they're next to impossible to even see. And so these three corporotomies reliably works to straighten the penis. Even when you get graft contracture, the corporotomies have healed well. But you have to try to cover the corporotomies as best you can in order to avoid any additional graft contracture because of what we talked about, how it's difficult for, you know, to, to have to explain why you need another step. But when you've had significant graft contracture and the graft has diminished in length by a substantial amount, you have to take that additional step. Um, cr cr yeah, creating a neourethra from a short piece of tissue when the penis is bent is not going to end in a happy place. And it's much easier to open up the partially contracted graft and, and save some of your healthy stuff in the glands and place a little patch, which is something you can easily do with an oral graft and, and a redo, for instance. Um, it's much easier to do a small patch than to replace the entire thing. So let's take a redo, for instance, where none of this was saved and our um, proximal urethrostomy is down here at the penis scrotal junction. We have three corporotomies that are exposed and the graft contracture will generally happen if it's going to happen right there. The rate of graft contracture, again, is only about 7%, which is the same rate of contracture that you see in buyer's flaps. So... Or, or, or even less, that's right. There is a substantial amount of redo that has to take place between the first and second stages, even in a buyer's flap scenario. Traction occurred, and we 
don't burn a bridge and, and get rid of Tunica Vaginalis. Okay, we're pretty close there. So now we're going to reconstruct the scrotum. And sometimes we actually have to move the testicles down superficially, like right here, so that we can create a nice penoscrotal junction without those testicles in our way. This is another reason not to do orchipexy first. That's, that's right. The scrotum in boys with, with proximal hypospadias is not in the correct anatomic position. We saw earlier in this case how it went up onto the base of his penis. These are subcutaneous tissues that were part of that, and we're doing mm -hmm. this to stimulate bleeding into. <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah. It's in your way the entire time you're trying to do these maneuvers. There's scar tissue that's there. Yeah, even if you put the testicle all the way in the bottom of the scrotum, the scrotum isn't in the right place. And you got to move all of that down. We've certainly seen boys who have had that done, and the testicles are in the mid scrotum when we turn to the second stage, and then we've got to bring them down lower. And they were in our way every step of the first stage. So we want to try to avoid that. Now, before we go to harvesting our graft, we don't want to do any of this be to size any of our graft or our shaft skin while we're just so loose like this because it's very easy to, to foreshorten your ventral skin by accidentally pulling up too high here. Okay, so we want to fix some points, and we're going to do that by fixing the penoscrotal junction at the 3 and 9 o'clock positions with the PDS to make sure that we have a long enough amount of shaft skin along the ventral surface. So, we want to have enough skin to cover the ventral shaft and to make the and we're going to begin not by focusing on the urethra, but by focusing on the penile skin. That's, that's a critical point to make. We, we have to have enough skin to close the penis. Were we to find out in a given patient after we do this that there just wasn't enough graft material to meet our needs, which has not happened, in well over a hundred of these cases. But if that patient came along, we'll find we have alternative sources of graft for the urethra. We can use oral mucosa, for example. But there is no substitute for penile skin. There is no skin that has the thinness and lack of hair that penile skin does. And so we have to be very conscious of that and preserve that so that we make a normal penis. The ventral side of the penis has to have a symmetric amount of skin to the dorsal side. And this is a technical change if you've watched any of our previous courses or even our previous proximal hypospadias video. We did not uh, in the past place these tacking sutures here at the 3 and 9 o'clock position at the first operation. We've always done it at the second operation because of the harvesting of tunica vaginalis. We're going to just remove a little bit more of this um, thickened scrotal dartos tissue right here. It's probably going to bleed, but that's right where I want to place my suture. And I, and I want to have as much flexibility on this skin to cover the ventral surface as possible. So by removing some of this thickened dartos, I'm just able to stretch this skin out because most commonly you're shorter of skin here on the left side of the penis than you are on the right side. And so you want to give uh, as much symmetry as you can to things. So by placing those marks here, 
I can place this stitch and, and be sure that I'm exactly where my mark is. That's an, a nice little uh, trick to use. And then again, because we want things to be symmetrical, I'm going to go back and look at where I placed this suture here on the right side and be sure I go to the same location here on the left side to fix this penoscrotal junction down there. And, and what this will do in addition to helping you harvest the right amount of graft and leave the correct amount of penile skin and other five of a PDS, um, this will also help prevent any um, telescoping of the penis, which may impact how your skin heals after your hypospadias repair. So we're going to try to take just a little bit of this dartos tissue right here on top, not through um, the urethra, but there was a little bit of tissue that was available. And just carefully coming through it and creating a normal penoscrotal junction in this patient. The other comment to make at this point is we are correcting penoscrotal transposition without making scrotal flaps. We quit making scrotal flaps probably a decade ago. Mosquito. In part because well the main reason because they're not necessary. We can correct penoscrotal transposition of any sort without making scrotal flaps. And those scrotal flaps I've heard people say, well, it doesn't matter because the scar will be hidden by hair growth and puberty. But the fact is that that's not always the case. And we have teenagers and adults we've seen where you can very clearly see those. Hair doesn't fish. grow in scars, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So see, we the scrotum right now. You can see just by her pulling that down, now the scrotum is in a normal relationship to the penis. Just by bringing that. So first we're going to need a 6O PDS. And we're going to place those in our corners of the propucial skin. And this is to help us remove this darto so that we can unfurl this inner propucial skin from the um, outer propucial and shaft skin below it. That's another key point. Some of you watching have been accustomed to managing prepuce for flaps and preserving the dartos underneath it. And, and you've learned that a flap of prepuce will only reach from roughly the penis scrotal junction outwards, but not more proximally. But the fact is that we will remove as these, um, removing these dartos tissue starts to unfurl this skin and how big it gets. Now oftentimes we don't need to go here in the midline and remove every last ounce of dartos because a lot of times where you're tethered is, is out here laterally and then of course at your junction here, distally, junction. of the inner and outer prepuce, as we spoke of a few seconds ago. So down lower than where the graft is going to be, we may not have to remove all the dartos, but out where the graft is going to come from, all of that dartos has to be removed, and it's much easier to remove off and drape it over your finger or 
provides you with a tremendous amount of extra skin that you can utilize. Now this is um, getting a little tricky because it's very stuck right here where the natural bend is in the propitial skin. And we wanna, the skin's gonna get very thin up here. We wanna be sure we're not making holes in the skin, but we still want to remove all of this dartos tissue because we don't want a fold going down the middle of our graft if we can help it. Sure. And then they heal on the penis even more thick, thick. Than th more thick than that, exactly. So that's why, for many reasons, prep use is by far the number one choice. And everyone fixing proximal hypospadias surgery needs to know how to harvest a propitial graft and also cover the penile shaft skin rather than Right now, we're mainly working on that area where the fold is. Where the inner and outer meets. And we'll just look how big this is all becoming. And we haven't even taken this part to us off down proximally. If we needed a longer graph. It helps to periodically wet your graft just so those tissues don't get dry. doing now is I'm trying to use the little teeth on my pickups to identify any last little bands of dartos to remove because we're about ready to size our graft and sizing our graft is a little bit of a misnomer because what we're really doing is sizing the penile shaft skin 
and everything else is our graft. So you can see why we put this stay suture here. We again want to pull that down and not allow this to pull up and for shorten our penile shaft skin along the ventral surface. And right here, you have to be very uh, careful with your assistant that they're not pulling up too snugly on these edges, which will again shorten your ventral penile skin. Because you don't want to put any of this together under tension if you can help that. And then for an additional layer of protection, you can have your assistant hold here in the midline. And then that really allows you to see exactly where you need your skin. So I'm gonna, so right here along, or I'm gonna cut and mark right here along where the corona is of my penis. And everything that's distal to that and in fact, a little bit of this corner right here, because you can see this is crossing the midline. So anything beyond midline we'll take with our graft. So our, our ventral penile skin is going to come to this corner right here to sew to the mucosal collar. And then I'm just marking right along where the glands is. And so I'll mark first that side. And since we've got such beautiful retraction here, we'll, we'll mark this side next. Again, this can go with our graft because right here is where we're going to want to sew the ventral skin up to the mucosal collar. And we'll mark right along the corona. So now my ventral surface is marked. And so we can come along to the dorsal surface and simply just, again, come right along the glands. Relax this a little. We're not symmetric here. And this shape of your graft will vary just a little bit depending on if you have a big hump right here. If you have a large hump, you'll have more skin that can rotate around to the ventral surface so you can actually have a bit more skin ventrally. If you have a hump right here, you can take this incision down a little lower because the skin from your hump will stretch upward. But in this patient, there's actually not really any humps. And these are some of the trickiest. They're the, the most minor in terms of their um, hypospadious appearance before you get started. But they're some of the trickier ones because they don't have a, a really weird hump to deal with which will allow you to have some extra skin. So he's going to hold right here. Remember, this is where I'm going to put my first stitch. So we'll use this little bit of skin just in case we need that for our graft to come up to that corner. And then we're simply going to do this, sizing our graft according to what we need for the penile skin. So. I'm cutting just simply right along here where all of this skin is going to fit right up next to the corona. So I'm doing my circumcision, incision, and my ventral penile skin reconstruction incision, and my graft harvest incision all with one fell swoop. So I'm doing this pretty quickly today because as he mentioned, we've done a lot of these and, and we know how it works. But this sh step should actually probably take you a bit of time the first few times that you do this because you don't want to mess this up. I'm going to come up to this corner here and then we will take that off right there. Again, the principle is to cover the penile shaft and then everything left over is grass. And if you do it that way, then there should be enough for both. If you happen to mess up, well, okay, you've always got a backup plan of going to oral, but you shouldn't have to, but yeah, for your urethroplasty, for your urethral graft, but you shouldn't have to do that 
in the vast majority of cases, and we haven't had to do it, but at least you've got a, a plan in place. That plan does not include going to the oral surface as your primary she said plan. for some really difficult second stages. Yeah, because we ended up throwing away some graft that we didn't need, but we had some borderline availability of penile shaft skin at the second stage that made the, the second stage skin closure much harder. And so one day Dr. Bush realized, wait, we're doing this backwards. If we're throwing away graft and we don't have enough just continue to march along sewing our shaft skin to the mucosal collar you note that all of our sutures along this are sub epithelial because we don't want to leave suture tracks in these patients so we do a sub epithelial suture now the exception to that is going to be up here along the um, the ventral surface of the graft where we sew the graft to the shaft skin, we'll actually make some epithelial sutures because we're going to be cutting through that at the next stage. All right, so we can cut that out now. To remove tension as we're sewing these back. And I'll go ahead and place this one suture here epithelially because oftentimes this skin will be really thin along the mucosal collar and it's easy to tear this skin and it's a hard and, and you don't want to, to tear it. It's difficult to make up skin along the mucosal collar. So you want a nice secure suture right here. And again, this is through the area where our junction with our graft will be so that we don't have to worry so much about a skin, um, skin bridge or a um, suture track there. That's what we said. Yeah. That's, what you That's what I said. It said it's going to be right at the junction with our graft. So we have a nice, beautiful piece of ventral skin here from flaps that we've, in essence, mobilized from the back. You remember our native meatus was down here. So this was the only ventral penile skin that we had when we started the case was, was this little bit between here and here. So all of this has been mobilized around from the dorsal and lateral surface of the penis.
one of the many suture tracks in patients who come to us for redo surgery. But clearly, the surgeon, the urologist, has seen the skin through and through. And, and we, we know that from reading articles that some of you are posing it, for example, with PDS, which is a long acting suture, et cetera. And, and, but no matter what suture. Even Chromac. We're spending a few moments here because this is a difficult thing that we often see in proximal hypospadias. You can see there's this fold of skin that's right here. And yet we have to have an adequate mucosal collar to sew our penile shaft skin to because if you don't have enough mucosal collar, when you come to close the glands the next time around, that this is a really important area to cover because of your rate of fistulas that most commonly occur right there in that subcoronal area. So to try to fix this, we have two options. Number one, we can try to unfurl this skin and wrap that around. And, and that's what I was just trying to do with that knife. And we've gotten some of it unfurled, but it, this one is particularly sticky. It, it doesn't really want to um, unfurl itself. And, and unfortunately, I've made some holes in skin here because it's such tissue paper thin that it can be very difficult to do. So when you end up with a stubborn fold like this that won't unfurl, then I think often the better thing to do is to just essentially remove the fold of skin right here. And that will give a pretty natural appearance to things. We can tailor that up at the, at the next step um, if we need to, to kind of just try to make that nice and, and a smooth mucosal collar all the way around. And then we'll go ahead and, and utilize this area for our shaft coverage of our, or for our um, anastomosis to the shaft skin for the mucosal collar. So all these little details, and this is all going to go away. That's our midline incision. Our edge of our corona is right here. So we'll take this little triangle of skin off. All of these little um, details make a, a big difference when these kids grow up and get, and get bigger. And you can see where shortcuts were taken. So you see that we spend actually quite a bit of time on these details to make things perfect. As much time on the skin as we do sometimes the entire hypospadias repairs. Mosquito. Especially right here because people tend to take big bites and they leave a train track appearance and then in order to get rid of that if you've you know made a train track through with epithelial sutures you have to excise some of the scrotum as well
guarantee to have that. The other thing to mention is that we really do essentially all of these hyperspace repair at this stage, meaning we straighten the penis, we put the urethra, we do part of the urethroplasty, we do the circumcision, and we correct penis scrotal transposition and scrotal cleft, all of So we're going to sew up the midline just a bit because our proximal edge of our urethrostomy is up here and so we can go ahead and reconstruct the skin up to the level of the proximal urethrostomy. I didn't do that before harvesting the graft because it um, kind of inhibits your ability to retract all that penile skin for the dartos resection. So that's why we just rely on this one penoscrotal stitch down there. But now that we've got the graft all harvested, we can go ahead and start this reconstruction as well. So that again, at the very end, all we have to do is put our graft in. But everything else is all set and ready to go. I'll take a 9 -ohm. When you have a little bit of PDS right here that is sticking out, it's easy to close with an epithelial suture over it. We'll use a little 9 vicral so that if a suture tract is left, it's so difficult to see with the naked eye that it's not a functional problem.
are intentionally showing this video without editing because inevitably when you start editing, you take out little aspects of it without even realizing that they might be helpful to somebody. And also so you can just see the pace at which the operation proceeds and if we get into trouble so you can see us get in and get out of that too. So many years ago we decided one problem with mm -hmm. learning from surgical videos, for example, at national meetings is that for sake of time, they take a three hour operation But you also noted, even though we didn't talk about it because we were in the process of saying something else, that we spatulated this earlier so that we made it um, wider than it actually was by cutting right through that really thin skin. So we've got a nice wide opening here for our proximal urethrostomy. And Again, you'll see us doing these epithelial sutures here because, of course, we're going to be going right back through this at the next stage when we come around our proximal urethrostomy. So we don't mind doing an epithelial suture right there. Since we had a little extra on this corner here, I'm going to go ahead and take this up to secure it to the mucosal collar here. Just this is such a crucial area where you don't want to have for shortened penile skin at the second stage. It is a bit snug, but we've got pick up some redundancy a little bit right here. And so I'm going to make a little relaxing incision because you'll, you'll see that we're not quite even in our skin here. But I would like to go ahead and preserve that. So we did this on purpose because we know we have just a little bit of extra skin right there where we can easily close this at the next step. Remember that we start out with a thin skirt, I'll have to 
play a minute to see which way the graph lays the best. And that looks pretty good. So that's partly why we don't why we don't remove these stays here. It makes it much easier to move the graft around at this stage in the game. But now that it's in our way for laying it out smoothly, we'll go ahead and move that. Yeah, I think that works for me. size our corona and our glands first because this is the most critical part at the, second stage. at the second stage is making sure your graft is wide enough in the glands Too wide. Yeah, so again, we, we have more graft than we need, and we just have to take a moment and trim it in the optimal way. We, obviously, we want no tension on the graft. Graphs want to shrink a little bit, and so we don't want to put it down tight at all. Hold here. So, in essence, the edges of our graft are going to come straight down from the corona. We kind of want a nice rectangle of a graft. So that's what we're planning on. So it's only this little tiny corner right here that's sticking out and just a little bit right here. So we're just going to trim a little bit at a time and, and we'll continue to put our stitches in and then trim more as we move along. But what you don't want to do is trim too much at the beginning because you, you really want this graph to be laid out nice and wide and flat before you start removing tissues that you may regret. So right there, just about a centimeter below your gland suture is a great place to put a stay for retraction there for him. And we like to put these stays periodically along the graph because that helps us to size everything up. Because you could, if you need more length, you can make it a little bit more narrow. In these circumstances, we want lots of width, though. I think there might have been a little skin folded under right here. Just going to trim that just a little bit to get it nice and flush. I'm going to 
move this, sorry, it's going to make you a bit dizzy for just a second, but that way you can see just a little bit better. We've seen patients in whom the surgeon did not do these little steps right, and they end up with lifelong scars around the, the meatus. And all of these things are avoidable and don't achieve the goal of the normal future tracks or anything else. It's nice and smooth. You see how wide and smooth our graft is? This is the critical difference. This is one of possibly two critical differences when the prep use is handled as a graft rather than as a flap. Maybe three critical differences come to mind. One is that with buyers flaps, surgeons have not typically been able to move this much tissue in between the glands wings, as you can with the flap. Secondly, the ends of buyer's flaps have relatively decreased vascularity. Our whole graft will grow new blood vessels in and be more evenly vascularized, which means how do we know that? Well, if we look at published series of buyer's flaps or other
it's a TG 140. Excuse me, 140-8 needle. This ophthalmic needle is, is plenty big enough to go through the graft and catch the tunic albogen underneath. When we use oral mucosa, it's not thick enough, not a big enough needle. And we use a 6-0 bifurc on an RB1 needle to penetrate the oral mucosa and catch the surface of the tunic albogen. You can use that same suture with this graft, but it's not necessary to have as big a needle. And once he's got a fixation suture up here, at least in the midline, then I can go ahead and finish tailoring the graft, which I'm going to do right up here to the level of my proximal urethrostomy. So we'll just cut right in the midline to take us up to that level without putting undue tension on the graft. So we want it to just lay there without having to stretch it. And I will take the suture down to secure this portion of the graft to the corpora underneath. So some people talk about pie crusting, making little holes in the graft instead of quilting the graft. We don't do that because those holes will close up very quickly, usually within a couple of days. And, and it, while, it's, yeah, while it's still getting its vascularity from below, and if there's any collection of blood or seroma underneath the uh, graft, between the corpora and the graft, you will have partial or complete loss of your graft. So we really want this to be fixed to the corpora. Again, that kind of concept of a backup system as we discussed earlier. Yes, first we're gonna put the graft down smooth. the 
grafts, the oral grafts, would meet the skin <coughs> laterally. It really scars uh, there. Way more so than prep use does. And so looking for, we, we have to use oral because in reviews, it tends to scar along the bottom margins. What can we do differently to reduce that? Because that can create a problem with tuberization and with chef's skin coverage at the second stage. So she had the idea of applying steroids and subsequently found out that the plastic surgeons use steroids and grafts all the time and with skin contracture all the time and it works beautifully to reduce skin contracture and, and we have avoided problems with grafts simply by applying steroid for that period of time beginning one month or so after surgery. So that, again, the key steps are important and in this instance, that treatment after surgery is important to get optimal results from stag repair. So you see it's all quilted. We need to put one more stitch here to quilt. And then we'll change these bicycle stays over to proline for the tie over dressing. Delay just a bit smoother, so I'm going to take this one stitch out. Go ahead and trim that up so it's nice and smooth. Oh, that's maybe going to be too short there. Always. 
even though it says eight French, they often will expand it. to replace that. That is not tight enough, I don't think. I'm sorry, but it's just not right. We left that proline too short. And I'm sorry, it's just pulling that skin down there. Right there. It's good. This is with a 6O PDA, uh, sorry, 6O proline instead of a 5O proline like we use here, just because we don't want anything big going through the margins of our corona. So now 